Hey, I'm Alicia, your non-monogamous relationship coach. Welcome to the podcast where my friends and I chat about our relationships, enthusiastic non-monogamy, polyamory, swinging, kink, and our lives. You'll get a candid peek into what makes it worth it to live life outside the box. And in case you're still wondering, nope, we're not monogamous. Hey, hey, hey. If you're feeling frustrated and misunderstood when your friends and family question your non-monogamous lifestyle choices, leaving you struggling to create a supportive environment for your kids, then you are not alone. Despite your efforts to educate and explain, you may find that your loved ones still hold really judgmental attitudes and don't really understand the loving and respectful nature of your relationships. Instead of the accepting environment that you desire, you might experience tension and conflict, making it challenging to raise your children in a non-judgmental and inclusive way. So step into the extraordinary world of co-creation, a voice for non-monogamous families, and a beacon of hope for those who dare to embrace the unconventional. Born into a family that defied social norms, Co's journey is a testament to the power of love and acceptance. Today's conversation delves into navigating social perceptions and structures, creating a really safe and supportive environment for kids, modeling open communication and trust. Co shares their own journey of growing up in a non-traditional family structure and the complexities they faced with um, a society that often reinforces conventional ideals. And I also share a lot of my own journey as a a non-monogamous parent and what that looks like. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. And hold on to your headphones, because I've got something else exciting for you. Did you know that your simple rating or review can be a huge game changer for this little podcast? The Review Reveal Extravaganza is here. (laughs) I'm reading your reviews live on air, and if I choose yours, you're in for a treat. Get ready to snag a fun prize, free access to one of my awesome online courses, like Getting It On in a Group, Intentional Threesomes, Foursomes, and Moresomes. So write a quick review and win like Angie Griffith did. She said, candid conversations about all aspects of life are so important. So it's so cool to see that Alicia is talking about a subject that's typically so hush-hush. Not many things do fit into a one-size-fits-all box. So the more open we can be, the more we can help others who are out there trying to figure out life. Oh, thank you, Angie. And, and that's not all, my friend. If you are itching for more podcast goodness, consider joining our Patreon supporters, becoming part of this exclusive crew. You're not only fueling our um, content engine and development, but also unlocking a vault of behind-the-scenes treasures, extra goodies, a whole lot of podcast love. I would love to see you there. Patreon.com slash notmonogamous. Let's conjure up some podcast magic together. So leave a review, dive into Patreon, And let's spread this news far and wide. Thank you so much for being an integral part of this community. I can hardly contain my excitement about sharing this journey with you. Happy listening. Got it. Awesome. Okay. So I am super, super, super excited to be talking to you today on nope we're not monogamous <laughs> <laughs> so um so I would love for you to introduce yourself just tell tell the people listening who you are since I already know who you are <laughs> well thank you so much for having me my name is co-creation that's k-o-e creation I use they them pronouns and I am your second generation sex educator for the 21st century I help harbor, foster intergenerational communication around what I call relational identities. So that is sexuality, gender, non-monogamy, and kink. And I aim to be the advocates for people who grew up in counterculture and particularly like queer spawn and poly kids um, and showing people that we turn out just fine. I love, love, love that term queer spawn. (laughs) I was telling, I was telling my 15 year old, uh, in the car today, I'm, I'm interviewing someone who wrote a book about growing up in a polyamorous family. Is there anything I should ask them? And he was like, I I don't know, (laughs) nothing. (laughs) Okay. 
fine. So right. it's not a big deal for you. Cool. Yeah, totally. <laughs> that, that's actually a great sign that you're doing a wonderful job, particularly yeah. like the normalization of being out to your children is a big thing that I talk about and not everybody can. I understand that. But for those who can, like normalization is a huge deal and going to be a way that we can gain like widespread international acceptance. So I think that that reaction is actually, you're doing great. That's a good sign. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's amazing. I love it so much. Um, I'm so excited you're here. I have a million questions I want to ask you, so I'll try to pare them down. Um, (laughs) Okay. First of all, so the title of your book is really long and I don't have it in front of me. Can you tell me what it is? Sure. The title is called This Heart Holds Many. This Heart Holds Many. And then the subtitle is My Life is the Non-Binary Millennial of a Polyamorous Family. Yes, that one. I love yeah. it so much. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> I love it. And I have it and I have a signed copy and I haven't read it yet though, uh, but I will. It's on my giant book list. <laughs> I'm shaking my head for the listeners at home. I'm shaking my head. That's totally fine. Yours is actually one of my very favorites. So can I tell them how we met? Yeah. So we meet myself and Alicia met at Sex Geek Summer Camp, which is a sex positive business intensive with a summer camp theme this summer. It was absolutely fabulous. And at the end of it, in line with the summer camp theme, there was a talent show. And I apparently have big, I'll go first energy. And so like every time I'm like in a showcase of some form, I'm always going first. Sex Geek Summer Camp was no exception. And so I'm standing up there and I'm like ready to sing this gay sea shanty. And I was like, you know what I've been learning this week is marketing and that there's every opportunity is a marketing opportunity if if you're suave enough about it. So I pulled out the remaining books that I brought to sell that weekend and I was like all right y'all I got three books left who wants them and you like shot your hand up immediately and you're like you pointed at yourself and you're like mine and I'm like done done <laughs> done and you had I'll take that one please before, yeah you'd paid me before the talent show was over I was like you are on top of it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that one's going on my bookshelf and I'm gonna read it <laughs> um you know because part of that is like I'm raising kids who yeah I have a non-binary kid I have, I have one kid who was like, I think I'm the only straight person in the family. <laughs> yeah. like, Sorry, babe. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sorry, my brother, oh, my brother was like that. And he calls himself the white sheep of our family. <laughs> I was like, buddy. Oh, <laughs> I know. I'm also like, but you're still, you're still non-monogamous and kinky. And he's like, I know, but I'm not queer. And I'm like, okay, whatever you need to sleep at night. Like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> That is amazing. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm curious, uh, are you monogamous, non-monogamous? What do you do? Wow, that's so (laughs) sweet. I I do identify as non-monogamous and I have always identified as non-monogamous. And let me tell you, teenage polyamory is its own entire trip. I'm excited to write a whole TV show about it one day. but yeah, so I've always identified as non-monogamous and to get it out of the way, it's not just because my parents were or yeah. are. Um, I did have access to that knowledge of a relationship structure from a much younger age. And so I think I got there a lot faster and I was honestly seeing like a lot of toxic monogamy tropes in media and I was, I'm a kid of the nineties. And so there was like a huge wave of divorce, which I think is really healthy and was a lot to like take in as a child of like, well, you're supposed to stay together forever. Also, like there's this rapidly rising divorce rate. And I'm like, what is going on? And then I saw Jerry Maguire and the, that infamous scene where Tom Cruise is standing there telling Renelle Zellweger, like soaked from the rain, like you complete me. I can't live without you. And I just, I, I was like, nine or 10. And I remember thinking, I never want Tom Cruise standing on the doorstep telling me I need to complete him. I just, I saw the inherent patriarchy that I didn't have the words for yet. And I was just like, no, thank you. So yeah, I I have chosen a different path thus far. Um, 
And also, I think that I am not closed to monogamy, but bless my polyamorous friends. They're very sweet. They're trying to look out for me. But when I'm talking about like, yeah, I just want monogamy where we're like, you know, deeply invested in the communication and dynamic of our relationship. And we like bring everything up to each other and we like actively choose all of the different ergonomic pieces of what our relationship looks like. They're like, honey, it kind of seemed like that's not really when you're saying monogamy on a dating app, that's not what you're going to find. Like maybe you want closed anchorship non-monogamy that then you like bring guest stars into sometimes and I'm like I don't know like where are my radical ethical monogamists at who knows so (laughs) I want more of those I know I know I think they might enjoy it you know if they're nerds like we are right (laughs) oh yes that is so good I love that you said that like not because my parents are non-monogamous it's just that (laughs) the veil was lifted for me (laughs) or it was never it was never closed (laughs) yeah yeah totally totally well like one of the things that I've come to understand over my years of like like growing up in counterculture like not just non-monogamy but like I, Seattle in the 90s I don't know if this is the same for other communities but there were like all the little concentric circles of counterculture community had at least overlaps right and so I was I was engaging with like like I was engaging with non-monogamy and I was engaging with queerness and I was engaging with um paganism and and also people with like multi-faith and I was engaging with like interracial like l- like looking at interracial relationships and like interracial non-monogamous relationships and I went to an indigenous um pedagogical school growing up and so I just had a lot of access and opportunity to look at like the non-dominant narratives like the narratives that society is trying to shove down our throats and how like that is a like you said that's a veil that's like a facade and I think that there's one thing that like this thread through my activism and my relationship life and my personal identity of like breaking apart the binary and see, seeking the truth and honoring truth in history my my dear friend Canyon Sayers Roods is a fabulous non-binary polyamorous indigenous activist who always talks about honoring truth in history and that has like kind of permeated everything that I do and and non-monogamy I think particularly unveils breaks apart um this this myth that that dyadic internally focused closed relating is the epitome of relating whilst also like like literally refusing to recognize the ownership structure the literal like capitalism inherent in that the individualism based on colonialism based on freaking agriculture you know um like because at least one of the things that I always I that really struck me when I was a kid was when Sex at Dawn talked about how agriculture was a major shift in how um, society structured themselves because then it was important to know where your genetics went to know who to give the farm to and I'm also like yeah but like also I don't know like I think that there's still this thread that like that's a justification for individualistic colonialism as well um Anyway, I got myself really hot. I'm going to take a deep breath. <laughs> I, um, I love the, I, I love that you talked about sex at dawn because it is, it's like one, like a really easy way to describe it. Mm-hmm. We don't act like, is that really the thing? Who knows? It's a good theory. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. I theory. just, uh, I reference it in my book. So sometimes I have to bring it up. So I feel justified in referencing it in my book. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh, I love it. <laughs> Um, what is it I want to ask you? Okay. I'm curious how, having been in an open poly family growing up, how your friends, teachers, people outside of your family reacted or what they like, what, what, what messages you got from outside your family, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Oh, totally. Totally. Yeah. Okay. So there's kind of like two or three different aspects to this. So with my extended family, 
Um, I, my biological mom and my biological uncle are a part of my poly family. They are not connected in any way, but they are a part of like the family cool, like a polycule family cool. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so their family, like their siblings and their family, there's like a pretty big cultural divide there. Mm. Uh, we have some like really happy with their Christianity and their conservative conservatism uh, relatives. And it's been really interesting to have like two siblings follow this counterculture path and then like have that cultural divide, like continue to divide us. Um, what's also been really interesting is that like my generation, a whole swath of like a whole swath of us have come out very queer or non-binary or both. And yeah. so it's like really interesting to watch that continue, but in a different way. And like, we want to have discourse, but it, it is really hard sometimes. Yeah. Um, like I remember my biological mom was in a quad that we lived with for most of my teenage years. And the quad came to the family reunion, like all of them. And that was like, I was really excited because I'm the kid, I'm like the middle child of my siblings and I just want everybody to get along all the time. And I was like, everybody's here, everybody's getting along. But it was like a big deal and it was like real tense and they only came for a couple of days. They didn't come for the whole time. But like my mom had to advocate really hard that not like one of them didn't come, all of them got to come, right? Yeah. So like that's one aspect. Um, the teachers at school, so we weren't fully out at school. Um, mm -hmm. there's like a, there's a piece in my book that I also, I, I am convinced is like a pretty big, like key piece of poly kid or raised in non-monogamy idea. Like specifically when I saw this represented on the show Sense8, I was like, oh my God, it's not just me. Um, but like the parent teacher meeting, the, the, the parent teacher conference, like that's a big deal. Like for whatever reason, it's the moment when like the family's coming into the educational space and needing to present themselves. Like subtly, you're not talking about the family structure necessarily. You're talking about the children's performance. But then like, you know, it's a feedback loop. Like they they yeah. influence each other. And so when my family would go in, and I write about this in my book, um, like my bio mom was there. Sometimes my bio dad was there most often. And then my the biological mother of my siblings was there and so it was like well and like sometimes like my mom would have I remember once my mom had a baby from a friend of ours like not in the polycule but just like had this baby and my teacher was like what is going on right like they didn't <laughs> fully know what to do and so we either had to like explain as best we could or it was thought of that my 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 non-bio mom who's the biological mother of my siblings was our like nanny which is how we got her on the pickup list or the emergency contact list or things yeah. like that, right? We had to work within the structures that were given to us at the time because like yeah. GSAs were brand new and they were not in elementary schools, right? We were not at the place where there was structural support. Yeah, um, wait, what's a GSA? Oh, uh, 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 when I was a kid, they were called Gay Straight Alliances. I think they're now oh, called- Oh, 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 got it something student alliance like qsa like queer student alliance got it okay yeah. okay yeah um <laughs> totally uh and then like specifically what i'm thinking about in that regard is that i was taught what i now know to be code switching at a very young yeah. age there was this sense that like in my family things were like safe and understood and you would always be accepted and very specifically that outside of our family, like uh, my non-bio mom calls it the overculture, the overculture would not understand, not just mm. like may not understand, but would not understand um, that CPS, Child Protective Services in, in our families and our communities was, was weaponized, yeah. right? Like I saw divorces happen of, uh, not in my family, but like of non-monogamous families. And then one parent decides that like, their shame overtakes them and everything they've done for the past X amount of years was wrong. And then they like call CPS on their former spouse. Mm -hmm. um, that was like happened more than one. And mm -hmm. it was, it was scary, right? It was yeah. scary to know that like your family that, that very specifically focused on support structure and nonviolent communication 
and open and honest, you know, relating and treating us as what we call tiny humans. Like we had autonomy and, and responsibility that was age appropriate to us, mm-hmm. right? All of those things that I thought were pretty cool and my parents were very into and nerdy about were not acceptable. And then like, as I got older, I'm like, then what is acceptable? And then I learned, and then I became an activist. Um, Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. and then particularly to kind of give this like a cute button, kind of, uh, and this story is in my book that my friends growing up had like, like levels. Yeah. And it was a little bit like a mission impossible. I don't know why a Tom Cruise is a theme during this podcast. That was not intentional, but like, it's just like, <laughs> this, well, like I'm going to mission- tag him. <laughs> Perfect. Oh God. Uh, but like, it's like this, it was like this mission impossible mission to be like, okay, friend is coming over to our house. Cause I always went to their house for the first time. A friend is coming over to our house. Mom, put on your clothes. Like, yep so-and-so like when are you coming home right and like we're gonna play outside for a while and then inside for a little while and like here's what we're telling the parents and like literally uh I had a friend with a really conservative parent and my mom wanted to invite them to my birthday party but they had been this parent had been like well I don't know about that person like you can hang out with them at school but not elsewise and my mom like like put on her like church going clothes you know she's from the midwest so she like she didn't wear any anything fun she just like really took her energy down and like went to this person's house and was like hello my name is so-and-so I would like to invite your child to come in and my mom happens to have like lobe and cartilage piercings and the first thing that this parent said to my mom was wow that's a lot of piercings you have moral of the story that that friend did not come to my birthday party um (laughs) you know and so there were like we had we had to hold the onus for being different yeah and my friends who ended up getting all the way to like Mach one friend um where they could you know be there when everything was normal were a big deal and honestly I still my two best friends from childhood I still have to this day like I keep in regular contact with both of them because like we formed a really special bond. It was like a level of, of platonic friendship intimacy that I don't know if other people get to. And I I honestly don't know, like, because I had the experience I had not others. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. You know, it's when you're talking about, um, how, what'd she call it? The overculture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, you know, you know, uh, people outside of our home may not understand this. I feel like that is something that most children go through in one way or another. There's so many things in families that are like, this is private. This is to stay within the household, or this is to stay within the family. Like we don't talk about crazy uncle Bob, or we don't, you know what I mean? Like, or, or we don't talk about how, uh, we're, our house is, is going to be foreclosed on, or we don't talk yeah. about, you know, like there's so many things that kids go through life thinking like I, I, or their through their childhood feeling like they yeah. have to hide from the outside world. Um, and I think it just kind of says like, it's not like weird or outside of the standard to have like this one thing that, that, that a kid has to like, What's the word I'm looking for? Really think about, maybe not hide, but like, I yeah. want to, I want to preserve some privacy. And I think kids th- from all sorts of families wind up doing that for one reason or another. Absolutely. I know I did. My parents were yeah. monogamous, but they were fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> there were only a couple of people that came to my house that were friends of mine because I was so embarrassed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, and like, and to bring it back around, like to me, that also speaks very highly of like, individualistic culture right Mm -hmm. we are not friends with our neighbors like our Mm -hmm. even if we're in small towns or communities like there's still that sense of like what could somebody else perceive me as like what are the optics on me that would make me a threat to this norm that would then get me in trouble right like that that is anti-collectivism if I've ever heard it right Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. exactly I'm actually curious um 
I've listened to some of your podcast, but not all of it. I'm curious, like, what are some of your like stories or metrics around navigating your non-monogamous family? Oh, oh, good question. You know, I was thinking <laughs> about that because like, you know, I, um, my husband and I have three kids from two different ex partners, right? Mm-hmm. So we were both married, had kids, got divorced, and then was, we're like, well, I don't want to be monogamous again. And then, and then remarried. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, so here we are, we, he and I have been together nine, 10 years and have never been monogamous together. And we're, we're, we're co-parenting multiple children. And there were a lot of fears around, you know, what if my ex finds out, you know, what could happen you know, like a CPS, a concern, mm-hmm. our jobs, a concern. He was in the military. He's not anymore. Thank goodness. Um, so mm. that was a concern. Um, and I just went the more open and honest and authentic that I am, the less like trouble there could be. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. at least then I don't have to navigate, like, I don't know anything that, that doesn't feel real or natural to me. So, uh, so we've just always been open and honest with the kids, with anybody who comes into our life. Um, and we even went through an entire custody battle with polyamory as the central argument against us having custody and won. So, Mm. (laughs) wow. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. That's in Washington. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just you know, I, I always have empathy for people who don't feel that they can be open. Um, and I completely understand all of the concerns. And also I think a lot of the concerns are blown out of proportion and things would not go as bad as they think they would. (laughs) Especially nowadays, like a lot, a lot has happened in the last 20 years. And like, I, I, I think that's also fair. Like you say that you were able to garner support in a very uh like like a custody battle right like a very uh not egalitarian but authoritarian um proceeding and that helps remind me that that is true now like my inner mm-hmm. child needed to hear that you know yeah. um yeah. yeah so i i really appreciate that i think that's wonderful and and that like i'm i'm also somebody who is very pro coming out to your children because they will know (laughs) whether you intend them to know or not they will um because they're very like you observe them they observe you they learn from you they can see dynamics that they don't actually understand and what do we do when we see something we don't understand we build narrative around it for ourselves to help us understand Mm -hmm. so they're going to be creating narratives that may not have your best intentions in mind or may feel like a secret that doesn't feel safe to them Right. Mm-hmm. And I know multiple adults who are like, yeah, I just thought my, my parent was a slut or like I thought that my parents were cheating on each other yeah. versus that normalization that I was talking about earlier where and it can be it doesn't have to be like all or nothing. Right. Age appropriateness, something I talk about in my book uh, mm-hmm. that was hugely influential to my childhood is a key to that. Right. You can talk about having lots of different loving people in your life you could even say like yes I kiss some of my friends the same way that I kiss your other parent um or you could choose not to do PDA in front of your kids right as they get older it could be like hey you know uncle so-and-so's house that we go to every summer yeah I sleep in that bed sometimes too right so if you need me in the morning like go ahead and come to that bed like again like what is the purpose of sharing the information Mm -hmm. um both for yourself and for your child and then like calculating what you think your child is capable of and also asking them what they are capable of right because they might surprise you um and I think like what I loved hearing about your story is that there was a balancing act there right like you understood some of the things that you do end up asking your of your children when you're out to them and like recognize the the counterpoint of like the stuff that would inherently also come up if you weren't out to them and so I think it's about this like balanced calculated was the word that I thought of when you were looking for it earlier like a calculated approach yeah 
which also then models that to them when they're going to be utilizing it in the outside world. Exactly. Exactly. I know people all the time ask, well, like, like, how do you, how do you explain it to the kids? What would you tell the kids? And I'm like, okay, Mm -hmm. look, at no point does a monogamous couple sit down with their kids and go, okay, we want to explain to you that we only have sex with each other. (laughs) Yeah. Like this happens. What? what? No. Do that for anything else. No. No. No, like that's the thing is like when you grow up, like kind of like you said, everybody has their own culture of origin. I recently yeah. found that term and I absolutely love it. I do too. Right. And so like the 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 specificities of people's intersections as they grow up create a unique culture mm-hmm. that is what they're they're being lovingly marinated in as children, right? And so when you um are accountable to yourselves in your relationships and how that affects your family like I think that's actually the key right like um and then and then your children are able to do to hopefully develop trust and grow up feeling like safe and supported and loved and all of those things without non-monogamy being like the central focus of it um one thing that I did want to bring up is that my parents had and I like I look back on them on this thing and I'm like wow um, if I wanted to stay friends with one of their partners and it wasn't like a non-safety issue with that particular person, but they just, it just didn't work out. I got to dictate that, mm. which meant that they had to break up in a way where they could maintain enough communication that I could go see that person. Yeah. And I was actually, and even it got like time went on. I was in my like late teens, early twenties. And the communication had kind of fallen apart with um, my bio dad and one of his long-term partners. Uh, but I still maintained a relationship with her. And I was a, I was an old enough teenager that I could do that on my own. And she actually asked me to come be the witness at their courthouse wedding. Yeah. Yeah. Alicia's, Alicia's like holding her chest, which is very sweet. Um, yeah. So... I really appreciate how my parents were accountable to their actions in their non-monogamy, which I think feeds into like healthy non-monogamous culture, right? In that like people are not inherently, um, I think about similarly, uh, one of my my, uh, dear indigenous friends, uh, Greg Castro, G-R-E-G-G, Castro, talks about in that uh, a piece of it of California indigenous pedagogy is that nobody is dispensable. Mm. And it relates to the fact that we are all stewards of the land. Like that is our role in the ecosystem of the land um, and relates to the fact because the land is, um, is not a resource to be extracted. It is, it is a thing to be cultivated and everything has a role. Everything has a, has a purpose and a, has relative, has relationality with everything else around it, including us. And so the way that we can be in relation with the land is similar to how we can be in relation with each other and not treat each other as extractive resources that then we can dispose of when we're done. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, it's just like breaking apart the dominant narratives that are even following us through when we're like trying to b- like break the intergenerational trauma and patterns and like live more true to ourselves. Sometimes those those vestiges still hang on. And this was a way that I I saw my parents working to stay in community and in restorative justice with each other so that they could be present. Everybody could be present for their children. Oh, I love that so much. I love that so much, especially because what we typically see in monogamous families, especially Mm -hmm. monogamous families that split up and then Mm -hmm. the parents start dating, but there's all these rules around like, well, don't introduce your children until you've been dating for six months or been in like a real relationship, right? Mm -hmm. Like whatever that means for six months or a year, or don't introduce my children to people. And I'm like, but like, we have cousins that visit once a year. We have all sorts of people that come in and out of our lives as as children. But for some reason, if there's a romantic connection, all of a sudden they're not allowed to come and go. Yeah. So weird. That possessiveness. Yeah. Yeah. It's so weird. And I'm like, (laughs) I don't feel like kids really care unless, unless the 
the intention or like like the impact that you're making it mean is like this is going to be your step parent this is going to be your your other parent replacement right right but kids don't think that unless no and that is like almost automatically assumed sometimes yeah within what i understand of monogamous culture which is again like an (laughs) outsider's perspective because i didn't grow up that way but like it's almost assumed that you have to take on like a co-parent role and that can be really hard for the person coming into the marriage as well like oh what do I mean to your child and like again I love the criticality there like I love actually like thinking about that Um, but there's a term that I I happen to coin in my in my work in my coaching work called meta parent m-e-t-a parent Oh. which is like being a metamor but with a non-romantic parental relationship because you have a relationship to that child if the parent says yes sometimes a parent has a don't ask don't tell between the you know the, right. the sweetheart and the child which like I also think is I would love it if everybody could know each other but if they don't like that's their thing but specifically like when you start to develop that relationship you don't have to go right into being a co-parent like that's a very Mm -hmm. deep intimate intricate relationship and so why don't you work on that meta connection and see where and how you do fit and also like somebody who is working on their their leadership and child care skills or somebody who like doesn't have an interest in that and is feeling really wiggly about it has the opportunity to take steps versus just like receive a mantle you know yeah yeah i love that term meta parents so much because like i have partners that know my kids my kids know them they trust them but they're not step parents but mm-hmm. it feels really weird to be like, well, they're, they're friends. Well, no, these are adults and these are children. They're not mm-hmm. friends. They aren't going and hanging out. Right. But they're like meta parents. They're like, yeah. they're yeah. like, they're, they're, that's my mom's friend. Like, right. <laughs> but right. I have yeah. very close friends that were way more parent-like than some of my partners. <laughs> yeah, really, totally. my platonic friends totally will like tell my kids what's up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm also getting old enough now that I have had a couple meta kids which and like meta kid is sort of like how I refer to them when I'm talking in these like you know really nerdy spaces I don't say that to their face necessarily yeah exactly (laughs) yeah we're still figuring out the semantics but like that that relationship is also is one that I value so much and like there are people that I'm no longer dating and when I've seen their kid like (laughs) I remember just a couple months ago I went out to dinner with like like the parents and the kid and the kid like came up and squeezed me really hard and it's like we haven't seen you in a long time and I'm like I know it's been so long they're like too long and my little heart just melted because I'm like oh god okay this is the other side of it you know like it's fine (laughs) I like received that as a kid and now I'm in a place where I can and and you know should or want to give that to the youth in my life that I get to engage with because that's beautiful so I love that so much yeah that's so good (laughs) thank you (laughs) Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Um, okay. As an advocate and activist and someone who talks about non-monogamy and gender diversity, what mm-hmm. advice do you have for people who are like exploring these aspects of their identity while while trying to navigate like social expectations judgment uh you know trying to navigate like all these different pieces yeah um and I think this advice for me is we've talked a lot about like how to present this to your children so I think this advice for me is like for anybody who's like parent or not parent right um I think that this is also like me talking to my younger self, but like patience, Um, Mm. you know, um, some patience and some understanding, which can be very hard to hold sometimes. Uh, I literally just had um, a, an interview the other day for like a 
you know, something official. And they were like, well, this is, um, this is not my question. This is something the clients might come to me with. And they're, they're going to ask me, are you a boy or a girl uh, or a man or a woman? And I just want to know how to support you and knowing what to say. So what do I say? And like, that was sweet and empathetic and caring and like all the things. And I was still mad. I was still like, why is this? the? Th I put my pronouns on the thing that no, no, dear self, like take a breath. You're, you're an educator, even in the moments when you don't want to be. And unfortunately, that has always been true because you grew up in a monogamous, a non-monogamous family that like you were put into the role of an educator at a very young age. Yeah. So I get that you're frustrated. Like mm -hmm. dear tiny co, I get that you're frustrated. Dear teenage co, I'm glad you're not yelling in this moment like you would be. And like dear now co, like you have this skill. Um, mm. And so I was able to talk about like my experience of how I like to be engaged with when it comes to gender, right? And a way to actually say that like, I'm relatively femme of center, but I also encompass a lot of gender. I, I am gender full and expansive. And so you'll see me in a lot of different kinds of dress. You'll see me with different affect, but that doesn't like uh, affect my professionalism. That doesn't affect who I am. And the way to encompass all of that is by using they, them pronouns. Right. And it doesn't actually tell you what my body is shaped like. And it doesn't tell you those things. It still helps. It's like, oh, I felt real slick. Right. Like, um, lovely. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. You can all use lovely. that. Um, and so I think that like having, like practicing for yourself a little bit, you know, knowing that these kinds of questions are going to come up mm -hmm. and then being able to speak to how you want to be like engaged with like the platinum rule have you heard of the platinum rule what's the platinum rule so the golden rule is treat others how you want to be treated but that assumes that other people want to be treated the same way that you do we've uh -huh. already talked about individualism we've already talked about intersections so the platinum rule is treat others how they are asking to be treated oh uh, right oh uh, that is like a breath of again. fresh air <laughs> yeah, yeah that is like yes Yes. Right. That's the and thing. that it's an avenue towards actual like equity and equality, not, not just equality, but actually speaks to equity. Like what do people need to be able to access things and be on a level with each other? Um, it speaks to listening, right. And like looking into somebody's particular story in an appropriate way to actually see them as a full-fledged human being and not just like a worker in this capitalist individualistic system um and I think that there's um it's a way to engage with like curiosity and best intention and allows people who do need to speak up for themselves like empowerment to be able to do that right and then you also, it's reciprocal. Like you can also ask for the things that you need. Um, so like, that's, that's, that's my like visionary, like what I always aim for. And then as I spoke to a little bit earlier, sometimes I have to mitigate that with like figuring out how to speak to that platinum rule in a way that that will land in my everyday life. Um, I've realized that, I mean, like I've been, I've identified as non-binary since 2007, um, since before we were using they, them pronouns. I remember at one point looking at somebody who, and we were like, did you use differential pronouns back in the day? And it's like, yeah, yeah. You remember when, when we all had to get on the they, them train? Yeah, I do. Like, I remember that moment. Um, and so I've been at this a long time and realizing like, I still need to come out every single day. Yeah. And like, doesn't matter what kind of community I'm in, doesn't matter the intersection of the person that I'm with, there's still going to be the need to advocate for myself. And so I can either find that endlessly exhausting, or I can also like apply some of that like curiosity and empathy to myself and, and be like, yeah, this is an opportunity to help change somebody's day, potentially. Um and, and particularly when that gets to happen in a safe way uh, with, that the parents approve of with youth, like that is what really 
helps feed me and helps me believe that like there's capacity for change in society. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <sighs> Platinum rule. That should be like, that's probably like the best relationship advice ever. If people just got comfortable, <laughs> like asking for what they want and how they want to be treated and then yeah. asking other people what they want and how they want to be treated. My God, we would not be, I'll be over here guessing, trying to figure out what other people want. <laughs> I thought you wanted yes. to be treated that way. That's what I would want. Yes. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's really good. Like, I think that I've subconsciously thought about that in non-monogamous, like, or in my relationship contexts, but I think I really like the way that you're making that explicit. Like, I know this says something that comes from like activism and and equitable justice and like like we've been talking about those are transferable skills right yeah, yeah. yeah. parenting too yeah right parents right. constantly assume what their kids might want how they might want to be held or reacted to or mm -hmm. what they what they need emotionally or just what they actually need right like yeah. i often assume my kid wants ramen and she really doesn't um <laughs> <laughs> yeah and we forget that we can say hey what do you want right now Yes. How do you, how do you want to be held in this? How do you want to be treated? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And like that can happen. I've been uh, doing early childhood education for the last several years and like that can happen pre-verbal, right? Oh, yeah. Like I was, I was, um, I was with some of my chosen family and they have this adorable, like now two-year-old, this is when they were one and they didn't have any words yet and I was like can I cup your face and I like asked the child and I like held up my hand and they straight up turned their whole head away from me and I was like great good to know like it was so so clear yeah. right of that moment of consent and of like engagement that it helped me it really landed for me like oh again age appropriately Right. Yeah. I'm not going to like ask somebody to like identify their, you know, core trauma so that I can relate to them better when they're like 12. Right. <laughs> but like, but engaging at the level that they, that is applicable to them. Yeah. Because then yeah. they will like that begets trust and they are more likely to come to you with the things yeah. that they're asking for later down the line. Absolutely. hundred percent. Mm. Is there, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you want to share with the listening folks? I mean, just to be clear, I love talking to you. I feel like I know, we right? could go on <laughs> and ever. I'd love uh -huh. to go on at another time, perhaps. Um, I could come up I with guess... like 27 topics. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I think that one of the only other things, this is just like an exciting like sneak preview tidbit, you know, for you and your listeners, um, is that, so I do coaching. Um, I do coaching of families and individuals, and that's kind of been my, my focus for a long time. And this winter, I wrote two television pilots and three children's books. <laughs> it was you know, it rained a lot in California this winter. I had a lot of home time. Um, <laughs> and so I, I have this sort of like wealth of media that I really want to make. And I want to like get produced and I'm looking, I'm like looking for an illustrator right now and I'm networking. Uh, I networked with somebody that we both met at Sex Geek Summer Camp about my pilot, which was very exciting. Um, and like, that's just really, really bubbling up within me right now. And I just wanted to like put out there that one, I see non-monogamous media. It's been around, like there's even stuff that people might not think about from like 20 years ago, yeah. um, but there is more proliferance of it, but it's still very much this, um, this sense of like, like, do you know the trope, the lesbian trope about like the lesbian that, like comes in and kind of like mucks everything up and then is gone like three episodes later? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm seeing that happen with non-monogamy. It's kind of like somebody tries for a triad and then it explodes and then that's never what could work for me. I'm going back to monogamy. Uh -huh. Like I've been seeing that happen more and more in media of late. Yeah. Um, and so I'm just like curious about other people's thoughts on like non-monogamy tropes and like what we want to see out of non-monogamous media. Cause like, I, I really want to see families. Like I wrote a pilot about a poly family and that's the one that I'm really working on networking right now. 
if you're in the entertainment industry, please contact me. Um, and, and also like, like the one thing that gets me is like, why are we looking at non-monogamy as just like the whole picture of like the reason it doesn't work, which is like something we deal with in real life, right? Is like, oh, well, it must be the non-monogamy. And it's like, no, it's the, it's the like, consummate lying that's actually the problem you know what I mean and so like it's just in, relationships it's just, and all our shitty relationship skills exactly exactly right and uh and I see that happening in media whereas like I want to see things that are healthy mono- non-monogamy because yeah. there's so much richness there like there's so much intricacy and opportunity for miscommunication that could be really juicy in like an, a writing entertainment way yeah. So I, I just like, that is like really what's up for me right now. And the thing I'm the most passionate about. And like, like I said, I have a lot in the bank that I want to get out there. And I'm like, I'm kind of curious, like, what are some of your like favorite pieces of non-monogamous media or like tropes that you've seen, or like, what would you want to see out of your non-monogamous media landscape? Oh, that's really good. Um, so, so I, you mentioned one of my favorites earlier, Sensei yeah the whole the whole thing is like (laughs) so juicy yeah I love it um I also another one that I love that it was so like not at all central to the story not even like it's like a a blip like it's just a thing that's mentioned like no big deal was um was a sci-fi show they're in space and the main guy comes from a polyamorous family and now I'm drawing the expanse really the expanse the main character grew up in an eight person polycule and it 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 had to do with one they 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 made like they pulled genetics from all eight people to make this baby so it's future (laughs) right very futuristic Mm -hmm. and um part of that was for property ownership on earth because property was scarce um and so they would make children that had the entire family um but it was just like it wasn't even central to the story at all it was just like yeah that's just a part of the story like that's just who this character is and I loved the way they did that that's awesome that's really cool I have not seen the expanse and now that is like another reason to potentially go look at it oh so good (laughs) cool that's awesome Yeah. yeah 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 I yeah it's something I'm I'm very curious about I'm interested in I can like send you some of my favorites that maybe you can put in the show notes of this episode for yeah. for your wonderful listeners and wonderful listeners what are your favorites like oh, will yeah. you comment on social media and tell us so that we can all like go and watch the cool things that would be great thank you yes yes yeah. I love that I'm always looking for stuff there was another one that we watched that I liked and hated and loved all at the same time because I loved it because it was just like drama Yes. Um, I hated it for the representation and I cannot think of the name now. I will remember, but it was, they kept using the word thruple, which I hate the word thruple. Really? I hate, I love triad. I hate thruple. Like, why are we trying to make couple more palatable or like, uh-huh. you know, like, like it yeah. sounds like couple, but plus one. Right. Right. Yeah. This is a fascinating one. This is like, this is juicy to me because I am having this conversation with a lot of people and that is absolutely the word that's taking off in like mainstream culture um, and in fandom, like fanfic loves the word throuple. Uh Um, One thing that I have noticed about it is from my understanding, it's come from gay male community. Oh. Right. Which historically, at least in my experience, like there is a lot of non-monogamy that that happens in gay male community and like there's acceptance around that in, you know, in certain ways. Um, and there is like a massive cultural divide. Like, I don't see as many gay male, like polycules or individuals like showing up to the poly munches that I go to, or my family used to hold, or like the poly queer spaces that I inhabit. And like, that makes me curious and a little like sad, honestly. Cause again, I'm the pansexual middle child who wants everyone to get along right that's my my Please don't ever ask me what my favorite anything is because I cannot decide <laughs> I know it's true <laughs> it's true um but in that way I think that I I really want there to be embrace of the word thruple because mm. it comes from a cultural context that is not getting the same like support or or focus yeah um from our community 
as they that. are like doing for representation in our community. So like, I'm not trying to change your mind. I just like, that's- I mean, you've got me thinking though. Cool. Because <laughs> it very much felt like this is the way some monogamous folks made it feel more okay. Like, yeah. oh, we it's fine because they're they're a thruple. There's it's like a normal relationship with just an extra person. Yep. Right. There's it's not too weird. It's just another there's just another person. Right, 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 right. No. Except I yeah. have an open triad. Yeah. And we all have partners outside of that. So it's like like if you say thruple, it just kind of assumes it's just a three person relationship. That's it. It's just monogamy plus one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So not it's like assumed polyfidelity. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No, totally. that makes a lot of sense. Neat. Uh, you are amazing. I'm so happy to have you on. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. Like meeting you at Sex Geek Summer Camp was one of my highlights and I really love the work that you do. And yeah. thank you. Same. Thank you. How can people find you? Well, um, so again, thank you so much for having me. My name is Co-Creation. That's K-O-E Creation. So that's K-O-E Creation.com and K-O-E Creation on socials. And you can find my book. It's called This Heart Holds Many by Co-Creation. Um, you can find the ebook on online, like on Goodreads and things of that nature. And then if you want a physical copy, there is now a limited run of the first edition because I'm working on my second edition right now. You're getting all of the juicy details from the coexistence. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm working on my second edition. Uh, so if you would like a signed copy of the first edition of This Heart Holds Many, you can contact me directly through like a direct message on those platforms and I will send it to you uh all signed and gorgeous um and then I'm going I'm currently working on my audiobook um and it will be coming out on my Patreon within the next year so if you would like to support the coexistence is what I call my body of work um if you want to support me in the coexistence you can go to patreon.com slash co-creation that's k-o-e creation I have multiple tiers for financial accessibility and my audiobook will be coming out on that within the next year oh you should you should release it chapter by chapter oh yeah that's the plan oh yeah <laughs> it's also easier to record <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> okay i have one more question um this one does not go out on the regular podcast but is for my patreon supporters at patreon.com slash not monogamous and it is uh called just the tip and it's what is your favorite or best sex tip Amazing. Thank you so, so, so much. Yeah. I appreciate the heck out of you. Same. I would love to come back on another time for one of your 27 topics. You're fabulous. And I can't wait to talk to you again. Oh yeah. We'll totally do that. <laughs> that was co-creation. What a great conversation. Uh, if you did not get to hear Co's just the tip, <laughs> go join our Patreon at patreon.com slash not monogamous. And you can hear their favorite sex tip. Uh, <laughs> which is always fun. Um, I hope you enjoyed this show and I will talk to you soon. Bye.